To Know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here's your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Well, today's study is the Ten Commandments. And when we think about the church, a lot of people say, I don't want to have anything to do with the church because all it is is just a bunch of rules. Don't do this, don't do that. It's just so restrictive. Well, as Christians, we are about freedom. But do laws, do they restrict or do they allow life? Think about it. As you're playing a ball game like baseball, if you didn't have any rules, would that be good? Or how about as you drive your car saying, well, you know, I hate driving my car because there's all these laws, there's all these rules. Well, do you think it'd be better driving your car without laws? No, laws are there for our protection. They don't restrict life, but rather they allow life. And so as we think about the commandments of God, they bring order to society. Just as God placed the physical laws so that, for instance, the planets are all in line in that they are all orbiting the sun, and that we can count on the seasons and what's to happen in every season, that's a good thing. You know, on July 20th, here in the Midwest, it's probably a pretty good day that we can go on a picnic. But what if we couldn't predict that, to say, well, maybe July 20th we're going to get a bad snowstorm? No, we're thankful for the physical laws. And so it is that God has also given us social laws so that we have order in society. It allows us to be able to have life. When I was younger, I was working on a landscaping crew, and we were spending a week landscaping this brand new apartment complex. And so we went to this town, and the apartment complex was right on the edge of town. And so we were going to put in this very nice lawn, as well as trees and rocks and, and everything. But right on the other side of the property line is just rough, then a field, and then forest. And so as we got there on Monday, there was a cantankerous old man standing there by the name of Ole. He was very upset, and he was asking, who's the supervisor? And so he was, you know, talking to the supervisor and yelling at the supervisor because the people who dropped off the sod that we were going to lay placed the sod just a couple of feet onto his property. Now here again, it's not like they placed it on a manicured lawn. It was just a little bit of rough, then a field, and then woods beyond the field. But the supervisor didn't argue with Ole. Instead, the supervisor said, we will move it. And so we spent time moving all the sod a couple feet off of his property. And all I was thinking is, this is going to be a long week. Well, the next day, Ole shows up, this being now Tuesday, and he was as cantankerous as ever, and he was doing everything that he could to, to instigate, uh, antagonize, just looking to kind of pick a fight. Well, then on Wednesday, he came, doing the same thing, and finally I just said, Ole, what church do you belong to in this town? He became silent. I said, well, you must belong to one of the churches. You know, was it a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, a Methodist church, a Baptist church? Well, he didn't answer. Thursday came, and he came up to us, and he said, well, when are you going to be done with this job? And we said, well, tomorrow being Friday. And he said, my wife and I would like to have you all over for coffee. Over to his house for coffee. I just about fell over. And so on Friday, when we were done with the job, we went to Oli's house, and we met Oli's wife, and she was just the sweetest lady. And she had her table all set with a beautiful tablecloth, you know, beautiful china, and all kinds of breads and cookies and coffee, and we sat down. And 
Oli's wife was so sweet. And Oli, he was trying to behave like a gentleman. But finally, I brought up the subject again and said, Oli, what church do you belong to in this town? At that point, Oli, he took his fist and he pounded it on the table and he says, I know my Ten Commandments. What more is there? At that point, I thought, well, I don't know if I can argue this guy into the kingdom, but I shared with him a little bit, just, well, it's coming to know our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we think about the Ten Commandments, or as we, the Ten Commandments, what are they? Well, I'm going to read the Ten Commandments, and I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your uh, manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And so these are the basic laws, the Ten Commandments of Life. And I always say that if people can follow these basic rules in life, life will go well with them, just as you know the Scripture says there. But when people start breaking these laws, life gets complex rather quickly. Life becomes very hard. And so these basic laws of life, But as I read now from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 26, we hear this story, the story of the rich young man. Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This man wants to inherit eternal life. 
And so he asked Jesus that question, what must I do? But the thing of it is, is that it's not anything that we do, but rather it's putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, well, have you followed the commandments? And he says, yes, I follow them. I have obeyed them ever since the time that I was young. Well, then Jesus is basically saying, but there is something more. And that goes with the question saying, well, if this man can't be saved, I mean, we all see him. He follows all of the commandments. He lives a good life. If he can't be saved, then who can? And that's where Jesus is basically saying that we cannot save ourselves by human effort. Nobody can keep the law perfectly. Nobody can merit eternal life by doing good works or whatever it is that we think. But with God, all things are possible. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for us and is arisen. And that when we put our faith and trust in what Jesus has done, that is our salvation. We have eternal life. And so what was sad about this story is that Jesus offered this man eternal life and he turned it down. Let us not make that mistake, but let us always realize that salvation is in our Lord Jesus Christ apart from the law. But yet the law is very important. Like I said, God has given to us these laws so that we can have order in society. But these laws also convict, because as we try to obey these laws, saying, yeah, I'm really doing all that I can to obey these laws, that we find ourselves falling short. And so the law not only creates order, but it also convicts us. The Holy Spirit uses the law to convict us of our sins. But the good news is, is that in Jesus Christ, we are saved by our Lord Jesus, that we are no longer bound to the law, but rather we are free from it. You know, the law wants to put us in prison, so to speak. But Jesus fulfills the law. And then Jesus frees us from the law. And that was the work that he did upon the cross. And that's the blessedness of the Savior. And the thing that we must always remember is that the law convicts. But it is Jesus Christ who frees. So that we are no longer under the law. The law no longer has authority. It no longer has jurisdiction over us because we live a new life in our Lord Jesus Christ. I think about what is written in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. That the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You know, Jesus summed up the law by saying, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so love is the key, that love supersedes the law. Because if you have love for your neighbor, you're certainly not going to do anything that's going to harm your neighbor in any way. And so do we just do away with the law then? What is the approach that we have? Well, yes, we live our lives each day in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray to God and we ask for his love to come into our hearts so that we may have the fulfillment of what Jesus has done upon the cross, that salvation life has come to us, and that we also may have his love within our heart so that we may love the Lord our God and so that we may love our neighbor. And if everybody does that, well, then everything will go well. But the fact of it is, is that our love oftentimes wanes. And sometimes it goes beneath what it should be. Our tank is not maybe filled with a whole lot of love for, for God and others. And so the law is a safety net to say, okay, right now you don't have any love for your neighbor, but these laws are here to make sure that you don't do anything to harm your neighbor. And if you do, there are consequences. And so as we think about the law that it's not so much what we are not to be doing, but rather what it is that we are to be doing. 
And so the first three commandments have to do with God. That we are to have no other gods before us. In other words, we are to love and to fear God above all other things. That God is number one. God is our top priority. And that our lives now are completely invested in him as he invests his life in our Lord Jesus Christ in us. We commit our lives to the Lord. We dedicate our lives to the Lord. And we do all that we can to worship the Lord, to honor the Lord in our lives. The second commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord God your in vain. And of course, that means that we aren't to be using God's word as a, as a swear word. We're not to use God's word, name as um, superstitiously, like a rabbit's foot, saying, you know, if I just pray to Jesus or if I just mention Jesus' name, then that'll be good luck. Or to swear falsely, to say, well, I'm going to, you know, I swear on a stack of Bibles. No, you don't do that. You don't take Jesus' name as a way to get out of trouble. But rather, we are to use his name in honor and prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Because remember, it's in the name of our Lord, it's in the name of Jesus, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And that we are to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. That the way that God has designed our lives is that we are to work six days. But on that seventh day, our body needs a rest. That it's a time that we need to rest our bodies. But it's also in that time that we need to not only rest, but then to rejuvenate our souls. And so we do that by going to church and worshiping and to hear God's word that we may be filled with, with his goodness, that the Holy Spirit fills our lives and then the other commandments, well, then they have to do with our relationship and our love for others. That we are to honor our father and our mother. And this means that we don't go and say, well, this is my old man and my old lady. That we don't do things that are upsetting to them. You know, our, our parents say, well, God has given to us our parents to be able to instruct us and to train us in the ways of God. They protect us, they provide for us, they guide us, they teach us right from wrong. And so to rebel against them is horrific. You know, the pain and the agony that it creates our parents when we do so. And so with the Heavenly Father. But this not only implies our parents, but it also implies other people in authority, such as you know, the police officers, our teachers, our coaches, our supervisors at work, government leaders. But here again, this is also with the understanding that those who lead us, such as our parents, that they are God-fearing people, that they truly do love us. You know, I think about what is written in Ephesians chapter, in Ephesians chapter 5, where... You know, verses 1 through 4, where it is just, where Paul's laying, down, laying it on the line, saying that as parents, you are to be God-fearing people to train your, your children in the ways of God, and that you are not to anger and provoke your children. And so with that understanding, we honor our parents. We shall not kill. It means that we don't take somebody's life but also in love, though, that we do everything that we can to protect our neighbor. Make sure that our neighbor has a roof over his head to make sure that she is fed. Whatever the physical needs may be. We should not commit adultery. This means that we do not have relationships with with our neighbor's wife. But instead, we honor marriage, and we do what we can to strengthen our neighbor's marriages, to say that I am here, I'm, I'm for marriage, and I'm here to help, you, help strengthen your marriage, and then thou, sh you know, thou shall not steal, we shall not steal, meaning that we don't take what belongs to our neighbor, but rather in love that we do what we can to help protect what belongs to our neighbor. 
And then we shall not bear false witness against our neighbor, that we are not to lie, gossip, slander, or to do anything that's going to hurt our neighbor's reputation. I've seen where people's whole reputation has been destroyed because people start rumors. But rather, we are to speak well of our neighbors in love and to do what we can to protect our neighbor's reputation. And all of our neighbors, as far as all of what they are about, protecting you know, our reputation and also their ways of making a living. And then the last two commandments have to do with coveting. Coveting, to covet means to desire what belongs to somebody else. And of course, when we covet, then pretty soon we're desiring what doesn't belong to somebody else, or what doesn't belong to us, but belongs to somebody else. And so when we do that, then that's what leads into so many breaking out so many of these laws. When we covet, that can lead to murder. When we covet, that can lead to adultery. When we covet, that can lead to stealing. Covet means to desire, and so what we want to desire is that we want to desire the Lord in our lives. And when we desire the Lord in our lives and in love, then we're going to have a whole different attitude, a whole different perspective on how we treat our neighbors. But you see, when you have love for your neighbor, then you're not going to harm your neighbor in any way. And so do you see that in Jesus Christ and by his love that we are free from the law? There is a couple of verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, verses uh, 56 and 57. The Apostle Paul says, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sting of death is sin. Remember? The wages of sin is death. And what convicts us of our sins is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, Paul is, the Apostle Paul is just saying, once again, that the law is what convicts, but it is Jesus Christ who frees. And that we now live by the Spirit of God. We live by the Spirit, we walk by the Spirit, and as we do, we live in that freedom. Living the Christian life is not a restrictive life, but rather it is a life that frees. It frees us of, of our sins, of our guilt, of our condemnation. It frees us from the law and how it imprisons us, bounds us, so that we are now free to live as a child of God, to live as a person of love, to walk in the Spirit of God. And against such things there is no law. There's a story in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And let me read that. It'll just take me a second to look this passage up. But uh, John uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. It's a story about a woman who is caught in an adulterous relation, committing adultery. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives at dawn. He appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him and sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to, the, said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stopped, again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, 
the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. That's a beautiful story. I mean, the laws were such that you are not to commit adultery. And the consequences of committing adultery is that of being stoned to death. And so here were the teachers of the law, and those who enforced the law. And they had their case to say that it's time that we now put this woman to death through stoning. Well, that was the Jewish method of capital punishment, was stoning. The Romans' method of capital punishment was crucifixion. Jesus died on the cross. He was innocent. He had done nothing wrong. He had committed no sins. But as he died on the cross, he took upon himself all of the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. He's died for you and me. And so Jesus, in his wisdom, just simply said to all of them, well, all of you who have not sinned, cast the first stone. Well, when we are honest, when we do self-examination, to say, well, you know, maybe I should give the stones to my stones to somebody else because I deserve to be stoned. Because that's the just penalty. But all of them knew that they were sinners too. And so it's hard when we come to that conviction to say, oh, I'm a sinner now, that I can stand in judgment of my brother or my sister to condemn them. And so they dropped their stones. This woman was freed in Jesus Christ. Freed from her sin, freed from her guilt, freed from condemnation, from the stoning. And Jesus says, get up, go on your way, you are forgiven but live in the new life, the new life of living in the Holy Spirit, living in Jesus Christ, living in his love. And so it is with us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Live and walk in the freedom of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who make a donation to KFXB of $25 or more will receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Christmas Ponderings.